Good morning. My name is Melissa Almodovar. I'm the Interim Procurement Director for the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery or the CDBDR program. Um, this uh, meeting is being recorded. In this pre meeting, we are going to explain the process for the process with the number CDGBBR RFP 2022-01, request for proposals for construction managers under the R3 program. I would like to introduce uh, my team from the PRDOH. Along with me is Natalia de Jesus. She's the interim deputy director of the procurement division. Ms. Winnet Cortez, she's a technical specialist. Ms. Ruth Hernandez, technical specialist also. Um, Joanne Elise Camacho from the housing program from the Puerto Rico Department of Housing. Any questions submitted during this meeting will be answered in writing and will be published in an addendum. Any information provided in this meeting will not change the terms and conditions established in the request for proposals um, or RFP instructions. Everything that will change will have to be published in an addendum. Okay, um, all procurement processes shall be conducted in accordance with the terms and conditions established in the procurement manual and contractual requirements to, to guarantee full and open competition or fair treatment of all persons or entities involved in each procurement process. The procurement manual is available um, at the program's webpage at www.cdg-dr.pr.gov and is incorporated by reference and made an integral part of this RFP. Nothing said in this pre meeting will change any of the terms of the RFP except a written amendment to the solicitation issued through an addendum. The PRDOH is seeking to select highly qualified and skilled designers and contractors to provide construction manager services for the R3 program for the PRDOH as related to programs under the CDBDR grants. Specific activities and tasks under the scope of services um, for, the, for the, this process are included as attachment one, scope of work. The term of the contract will be um, for three years with optional annual extensions of up to two years for a total of five years. The PRDOH reserves the right to repeat the contract at any time during the performance of the contract. Nothing of the above um, will be understood as a prohibition to the selected proposer to compete in the new solicitation. The intent of this request for proposal is to procure services for repair works only. No reconstruction or new construction work will be awarded under the selected pros, uh, proposers under this contract. Um, now we will have Ms. Joeni uh, Camacho from the R3 program um, to give you more details of the scope of work. Joeni, go ahead. Thank you, Melissa. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Melissa said, I'm Joanny Camacho. I'm uh, director for the CDBGDR housing sector, specifically for R3. Uh, this is request for proposals 2022-01. And as she said, uh, we are looking for an increase in construction managers capacity through this uh, process. As an introduction and for the benefit of all of you that doesn't know the, the program, the R3s stand for repair, reconstruction, or relocation, which are the three main venues that we assist uh, the homeowners affected by the hurricanes. Um, this RFP is only for repairs works, and uh, that's why the repair is highlighted in this slide. And by definition, repair is uh, determined when the estimated cost of repair is less than $60,000. You can see uh, the definitions of recon and reload in that slide also. Next. This graphic shows the workflow from the beginning to the end from application intake 
it goes through eligibility. Then in parallel, the damage assessment and appraisal uh, and environmental review are done. And this results in an estimated cost of repairs. If the house is in a flood zone and is less estimated in less than $60,000, it is determined a repair. If not, a reconstruction or relocation uh, could be determined in some cases. The program can determine a repair in some cases that exceed the 60,000 uh, cap if a technical feasibility analysis supports it. If the home is in the floodplain, and this ECR is greater than 60K, it will be an elevated recon if, if uh, deemed feasible or a relocation. Next. As for the organization, organizational chart, uh, you have the us, the PRDO wish, the call center operator, which uh, is the initial program intake, the first point of contact for the applicants and uh, the general orientation for those applicants. The program managers, which work with the eligibility, the damage assessments, award determinations, progress inspections, and the close out. We had municipalities assist with the outreach process and some of them have uh, subrecipient agreements with us and are going to be um, working with the prog progress inspections in the projects. As for construction managers, uh, which are you guys, um, is the design, permitting, abatement, demolition, and repair works. And we have the environmental consultants, which are the ones that uh, make the environmental review and clearance of the projects. That's it for the general information of the program. And now we're gonna go briefly through the scope of work. <clears throat> the construction manager's uh, general responsibilities include uh, obviously the design of the repairs. In terms of the environmental, uh, you need to review the documentation provided by the environmental consultants before completing design documents, incorporating those findings of environmental reviews into the design and in, into the repair work and obtain the environmental clearance for uh, abatement projects. In terms of permitting, you need to obtain all relevant permits and approvals, close all relevant permits and approvals and incorporate permits requirements in designs, documents and specifications. You need to abate those uh, found hazardous materials and repair of no substantial damage homes. The program follows uh, green building standards. That's um, a brief list of what we're using right now. You can find these details in your RFP package. As I was saying, um, the environmental consultants will perform the environmental review of each elevated property. And once completed, uh, you're gonna be able to uh, review those uh, environmental reviews to consider and implement any environmental requirements during the design phase. You'll be responsible for securing and paying for all permits, work, testing, and certifications required for any required abatement work. You are responsible for certifying environmental clearance of the construction works at the end. In terms of permitting, you uh, will secure and pay for all incidental permits, endorsement, and certifications required to execute uh, the scope of work determined. Since these are repair works, it's not typical, but some demolition work may be required in, in the performance of um, the, the repair works. And if required, 
let an asbestos abate in the works must be performed and clear before any demolition takes place. It's in uh, your responsibility for performing all repair works. The, assess the damage assessment provided by the program managers will determine um, an estimated cost of repair. And then this um, will be based on you know, the cost of, of these repairs will be based on the program unit price list that the program use. And the construction managers must confirm that all work stated in the damage assessment report uh, is, is true and then adjust, adjust as needed. Always using uh, the program unit price list. Um, I'm going to pass to Javier Perez, Senior Program Manager for the program. He will go through some other details for the RFP. Thank you, Joanny. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, to, pro to provide an overview of the expected process, on your screen you will see a mid to high level representation of the typical re repair process. Um, in summary, uh, repair applications are assigned to the construction managers. After the assignment of the repair application, uh, a scope sidewalk will be conducted uh, by the construction manager and the program manager. During the scope sidewalk, the verification of the scope or the damage assessment takes place. And then the construction manager is to start the scope development of what will become the final, the final scope. Once the scope has been developed and completed, it is submitted to the program manager for their approval. The program manager will review the scope of work submitted by the construction manager and, and will either return it with requested changes or approve it. Once the scope of work is approved, the program manager proceeds to schedule the award coordination meeting with the, with the homeowner. Sometimes those award coordination meetings are attended by the construction manager. Um, after the uh, work coordination meeting and when uh, the applicant accepts the scope of work, the repair grant agreement is executed. Upon the execution of the grant agreement, the, the program manager will issue a repair task order to the, to the construction manager. Once the repair task order is issued, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the construction manager can begin the design uh, of the of the project. Uh, this will entail uh, testing for asbestos and lead-based paint, and if necessary, any design and permitting for the abatement that will be required. Uh, at the same time, the construction manager may begin the design of the, of the work uh, that will uh, be conducted for the repair of the structure. Uh, if abatement was required, uh, the abatement work is completed, and then the um, the permitting for the repair works uh, is submitted to to OCPE. Uh, once uh, OCPE uh, notifies of the approval of the work, the repair of the damaged home can commence. All work will be completed by the construction manager, and once completed, the construction manager will, re will request an inspection to the program manager to go and inspect the completed work. Uh, the program manager will schedule that inspection um, and conduct it. And again, if the work is deemed to have been completed per the approved scope of work, the work will be completed and the project can proceed to, um, to being closed out and is deemed completed. The R3 program continuously tracks and evaluates the performance of the construction managers. Specifically, the four metrics that are tracked are workmanship, which is quantified by examining the ratio of total failed inspections versus the total inspections performed. The average build time, which is a measure of the number of days from the notice to proceed to, to passing the final inspection. Uh, the work in progress, which is a ratio of the allocated work in the construction manager's um, pot versus the completed work. 
And at the end of every project, there's a client satisfaction survey, uh, which is provided by, by the applicants. Based on the performance of these, the PRDOH through its represent, representatives, the program managers can and will make adjustments on the amount of work that's assigned to the construction managers. The RFP, as well as the contract, will include a liquidated damages clause, which stands at $100 per day for each day a project is late. For repair projects, there's a 60-day completion requirement unless additional time is requested and approved by the program managers. Also for repair projects, there is a single pay point. Once all work has been completed, the R3 program manager will inspect the completed work and either approve it or not. Once the program manager approves the work, it's only then that the work becomes eligible for invoicing by the construction manager. Task order values are established through the use of Xactimate. Construction managers will generate the scope of work based on the scope sidewalk, as I just mentioned, and submit it to, to a, an R3 program manager. Again, the program manager will review the scope of work and either return it with changes requested or approve it. For this RFP, the unit costs are pre-established by the R3 program and are included in Exhibit O of the RFP. As part of your response, you will need to accept the pre-established cost, again, included in Exhibit O of the package of the RFP. Again, thank you everybody for calling in and that completes the operational brief from the previous call. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Joanny. Give me one minute. Hi, I'm Winnet Cortez. I will be talking about uh, the document acquisition, important dates, and other important aspects of the RFP. Give me one second here. Okay. The RFP document acquisition. The RFP documents are available for download at CDVGDR website about the important dates. Uh, submission of question and request for qualification, January 28, 2022. Responses to question and request for qualification, February 2, 2022. And proposal due date, remember, only electronic submission only, from February 16, 2022, up to on or before February 18, 2022. Each prospective proposer shall submit all questions in writing on or before January 28 to the CDVG DR mailing address. Responses to all proposer questions will be answered by Avenda and will be posted on the CDVG DR website. All procurement documents pertaining to the procurement process, including Avenda issued by, PR, by the PRDOH, are and will be available for download at the CDBGDR website. Proposals are to be submitted on the proposal due date and time. Responses to the RFP submitted after the prescribed deadline will not be allowed. Submission of responses to the RFP will only be accepted by electronic means. Proposers are advised that the PRDOH will neither require nor accept physical proposal submission. The proposal will receive access to submit the electronic proposal after registration process is completed through the CDVGDR website. At the scheduled due date for the electronic proposal submission, a link button will be enabled 
to provide access to the registration form. Prior electronic proposal submission on the CDBGDR website, proposal must take into consideration the following. Check your internet connection before starting to upload the electronic proposal documents. As the due date time draws near heavy traffic on the web server may cause delays. Plan ahead and leave ample time to prepare and submit your proposal. Proposal bear the risk of website inaccessibility due to heavy usage in the final hours before the RFP closing time. The proposal must submit the mandatory requirements, qualification and work approach, and the cost proposal requirements in the identified sections at the website. The documents must be submitted in PDF format. Multiple PDF may be merged into one single document. Also, multiple files may be uploaded in a zip file. The proposer is solely responsible for on-time submission of their electronic proposal. The PRDOH will only consider the electronic proposal that has been transmitted successfully within the RFP requested format. During document upload process, the proposer will be able to click on the documents and have a preview of the uploaded document. Incomplete electronic proposal with error or if viruses or corrupted files are found after the upload will not be accepted. During submission period, proposer experiencing any technical difficulties may contact the PRDOH at the procurement email. If CDBGDR website fails during the submission period on or before the scheduled time deadline, the PRDOH will provide instruction via addendum to the proposers. Now, uh, Ruth Hernandez will be talking about the technical requirement for this RFP. Hi, good morning. The technical requirements include mandatory requirements, qualifications, and work approach. Mandatory requirements will be, con will be scored as either pass or fail. Failure to comply with all of the mandatory requirements of this RFP will result in the disqualification of the proposer. Mandatory requirements include, among others, financial requirements, audited, reviewed, or compiled financial statements for the most recent two years issued by a certified public accountant and prepared in accordance with US generally accepted accounting principles. The financial statements must include a balance sheet statement of operations, statement of cash flows, and note to the financial statements, copy of income tax, returns for the same two years if proposer has more than one year in operation but less than two please provide the requested information for the last fiscal or calendar year most recent interim financial statements for a period ending not later than 19 days before the proposal submission date the interim financial statement must include at least a balance sheet and a statement of operation, line of credit or cash availability, the amount required of the unencumbered line of credit, available cash balance or a combination thereof is a minimum $2 million, pending litigation and no bankruptcy sworn statement. The information submitted will permit a pass or fail grading following a scoring process by the pure DOH. A total grading of 70% or more is required to obtain a rating of pass. All notarial documents executed outside of Puerto Rico shall be authenticated and subsequently need to have an apostille or certification from the Secretary of State, County Clerk, or corresponding authority of the state government. Notarial documents executed in one of the High Conventions of 1961 
participating countries shall include the corresponding apostille or certification issued pursuant to the Hague Convention of 1961. Notarial documents executed in countries which are not signatories of the Hague Convention of 1961 must be authenticated by the corresponding authority of the United States. Proposals will be evaluating using a best value approach. Proposer will be awarded points based on their technical capabilities and work approach. A score to each evaluation criteria will be assigned by the evaluation committee. To be considered qualified proposers, proposers need to obtain a score greater than or equal to 70 points in the evaluation of their qualifications and work approach. The proposer and first year subcontractor must be registered in the system for award management at the time of the proposal submission or initiate the registration process right after the proposal submission. For more information about the system for award management, go to the SAM website. There is no registration fee to create, renew, or update your organization information on SAM. Awards will only be issued to entities that are clear and not ineligible for award of a contract due to the suspension, debarment, or hot impose, limited denial of participation. We have a presentation from the Assistant Deputy Secretary for Disaster Recovery, Maria del Carmen Figueroa Correa, for an introduction to federal civil rights, compliance and labor standards, POADOH, press submission training. Thank you, Ruth. I'm going to share my screen right now. Here we are. Okay, here we are. Well, mine is the, the best part, right? The Federal Civil Rights Compliance. Today, we will discuss the overview of compliance roles and responsibilities, the overview of compliance areas and tools online, documenting efforts, training, and reporting. And of course, we're going to review some FAQs. Federal Civil Rights and Labor Standards. Section three, training, hiring, and contracting opportunities compliance, minority and woman-owned business participation compliance, fair housing and equal opportunity compliance, and Davis-Bacon and related ads compliance. Roles and responsibilities for compliance. Contractor roles and responsibilities include assigning staff who will attend to the day-to-day -day activities for civil rights compliance, attending trainings and workshops, using tools and templates provided by PRDOH, executing activities and documentation needed, participating in PRDOH-sponsored technical assistance, complete, completing quarterly reporting, and compliant with reporting. We have bonus points. To those proposers seeking Section 3 bonus points should provide their self-certification and sufficient evidence for how they qualify as a Section 3 business. PRDOH offers a template on our website. Proposers seeking MBE or WBE bonus points should provide a copy of their MWBE certification to evidence their status. Certificates should show dates that indicate currently active. Let's talk about section three. Section three is a federal requirement of the 24 CFR 75 from the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968. Section three policy we have made available publicly on, publicly on our website on the policy guide in English and in Spanish. Contractors must read and implement activities necessary to comply and oversee their subcontractors compliance to assure overall, overall compliance with the requirements. Section three benchmark. We have the Section 3 workers, 25%. We have 5% of the targeted Section 3 
workers and for a 100% uh, all workers. Section three business refers to a business concern meeting at least one of the following criteria documented within the last six month periods. It is at least 51% owned and controlled by low or very low income persons. It is a business that at least 51% is owned and controlled by current public housing residents or residents who currently live in Section 8 assisted housing. Over 75% of the labor hours performed for the business over the prior three months period are performed by Section 3 workers. A Section 3 worker is, a, is any worker who currently fits or where or, or when hired within the past five years fits at least one of the following categories as documented. The, the worker income for the previous or analyzed calendar year is below the income limit established by HUD. The worker is employed by a section three business concern and the worker is a youth build participant. A section three target worker for its housing and community development financial assistance project is a section three worker who is employed by a section three business concern or currently fits or when hired fit at least one of the following categories as documented within the past five years, living within the service area or the neighborhood of the project and or is a youth build participant. This is, these are the income limits for 2020 and 2021 that HUD has, has established for that category. Section three forms. We have the section three plan contractor or supercipient. This document template allows contractor or supercipients to identify how the plan on being in compliance with section three hiring, training, and contracting goals. The section three self certification forms help individuals and businesses identify if they meet the requirements to be considered a Section 3 individual or business. And documentation of effort form, these document templates allow contractors or supercipients to identify how they are performing efforts to be in compliance with Section 3 efforts. A Section 3 plan identify hiring needs, identify subcontracting needs, plan outreach efforts, prepare coordinators for the day-to-day -day activities, provide guidance on types of activities to be performed, define a complaint procedure, understand documenting efforts requirement, and understand reporting requirements. You can click here to take you uh, to the website and download a Section 3 plan template. Section 3, cell certification and hot business registry. We encourage businesses and individuals to complete search certification forms to uncover if they meet the income threshold for a Section 3 resident or a Section 3 business. You can click there and access our search certification forms. And in case of the HUD business registry, we also encourage qualifying business to also register with HUD as a Section 3 businesses. You have the, the website there. And you can search for Section 3 businesses as well in Puerto Rico area. Let's talk about MWBE. MWBE uh, ensure that when possible, contracts and other economic opportunities funded in whole or in part with federal fund funding, housing funding, and community development assistance are directed to minority business enterprise and woman business enterprise. MBE is defined as a business which is at least 51% owned, owned, operated and controlled on a daily basis by one or more in combination, can be American citizens of the following ethnic minority or gender. African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, Native American, Hasidic youth, persons with disabilities and other individuals who can prove social and economic disadvantage. Woman business enterprise is a concern that is at least 51% owned and controlled by one or more women, must be USA citizens or legal residents aliens, whose business information and principal place of business are in the US or its territories, and whose management and daily operation is controlled by women. 
These goals apply to professional services, purchasing supplies, and construction contracting. 10% for women-owned business and 10% for minority-owned business for a total of 20% participation goal. Contractors are expected to perform good faith efforts for contracting, subcontracting, and purchasing opportunities and 10,000 or more during the life of the contract. MWBE forms. We have the MWB utilization plan as well. We also have a template that allows contractors and subrecipients to identify how they plan on being compliant with MWBE contracting goals. And we also have a way report that we don't want to use unless it's totally necessary. And we have that template and help contractors and subrecipients identify if they meet their requirements to waive their goal for participation for MWB. MWB utilization plan includes compiled data for MWB subcontractors, plan ahead subcontracting needs, prepare user on creating supplier or contract store list of MWBE, provides awareness of meeting the goal for the contract, help with contracting utilization plan. You can click here to take you to the, our website for the MWBE utilization plan template. Also, the utilization plan can be used through the life of your contract with PRDOH. Completing the MWB utilization plan is easy. Read the general instruction in row three, and you will complete section A, B, and F from the document. Complete the information requested in the yellow cells. Here is where uh, in our website you can find the resources in English and Spanish templates and tools. Certified minority or woman-owned business can be those who have filed applications with SBA, EPA, DOT, and MBDA, WBENC, and the Puerto Rican Minority Supplier Development Council. All those entities can certify a minority or woman-owned business. Let's talk about fair housing and equal opportunity. PRDOH is subrecipients and contractors must comply with applicable federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination. These include housing activities as well as all federal funded programs and activities. Discrimination is prohibited against the following federally protected classes, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, age, familiar status, disability, gender identity, sexual orientation. The Fair Housing Act is Title uh, Eight of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, as amended in 1988, and includes many executive orders, laws, and statutes. Equal opportunity is afforded to protect uh, classes through a number of federal laws and executive orders, and here you have a list of them. PRDOH has public, uh, published the Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Guide for all CBGDR programs and made it available in English and Spanish. We also have published the language access policy and it made it available in English and Spanish. As a subrecipient of HUD financial assistance, PRDOH must ensure that its programs affirmatively further access to fair housing. The PRDOH CBDGDR program will take meaningful action to combat discrimination, overcome historic current of segregation, promote fair housing choice, and foster inclusive communities. All federally funded programs must ensure that policies and procedures do not deny the opportunity to participate in, access, or benefit from programs like the CBDGDR program, including employment opportunities. These requirements are enforced by HUD Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Reasonable accommodations are changes that are made at program policy, practice, service, which affords individuals with disabilities and equal opportunity to enjoy the benefits of the program. Section 504 requires that federally funded programs provide requested a reasonable accommodation or resolve modifications at the cost of the programs to individuals to the extent that they are reasonable and serve a verifiable, verifiable disability-related need. 
the CVGDR reasonable accommodation policy provides requirements and guidance to programs about the critical due diligence and the evaluation of these requests. The FS, the FCLS division assists programs in the handling and evaluation of these requests as needed. Limited English proficiency refers to a person's limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. PRDOH and contractors must ensure that a person's limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English will not place them in a disadvantage in the participation of programs being funded by CDGDR funding through PRDOH. PRDOH has recently approved its language access plan to direct how PRDOH and its subrecipients and contractors will take action to ensure meaningful access for those who are LAP or limited Spanish proficiency. Let's talk about Davis Bacon because this is a construction related uh, project, right? So we have uh, published the Davis Bacon policy and made it available in English and Spanish on, on our web website. PRDOH is the recipient and their contractors must implement and comply with the PRDOH Davis Bacon and related tax policy when applicable. Most construction projects funded with CBGDR funds must comply with DEBRA requirements to ensure that laborers and mechanics are paid prevailing wages, including overtime wages for the work performed on CBGDR funded projects. Contractors awarded contracts funded with CBGDR funds are responsible for understanding and complying with DEBRA requirements. Housing, this is a list or overview of federal labor standards and status. You have the Housing and Community Development Act. Uh, you have the Department of Labor. You have the Davis-Bacon Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act, and the Copeland Anti-Kickback Act. You also have the Davis-Bacon Act, Chapter 3, Section this section that requires payment of prevailing wages as determined by the Department of Labor provides a fair, a fair opportunity to compete in building programs funded by the federal government, prevents contractors from providing a below an area prevailing wages, generally applies to federally funded or assisted project value at more than $2,000 and contracts for the following types of work of public building or public works like construction, alteration, or repair, painting, and decorating. Contract work hours and safety standard acts. Workers shall not work more than 40 hours a week unless they get overtime. Projects must comply with safety standards. Copeland Anti-Kickback Anti Act requires payment of wages at once a week, only permissible payrolls deductions allowed, and the Fair Labor Standard Act sets the federal minimum wage and additional overtime requirements. Who implements DEBRA? The project team, the procurement team, the legal team, the compliance team, any contractors and subcontractors on the CDGDR funded projects, really. When you have a project where DEBRA applies, you have procurement doing a, that overview and that compliance. We have the pre bid meeting, which we are having today. We have the pre construction meeting. We will have the contract signing that will state those DEBRA regulations. We have on site interviews. We have certified payroll, payrolls that have to be uh, submitted weekly. We have project closeout letters. We have notifying the prime contractor and we have reporting and record keeping. Key phases in implementation for DEBRA. Incorporate the wage determination labor standards provision and hot form 40, 4010 into your bid documents. Hold a prepaid meeting to provide technical assistance to DEBRA and prior to awarding the contract. Incorporate prevailing and, and federal wage termination code from uh, Form uh, 4010 and contract labor law language. Hold a pre-construction meeting to provide technical assistance to your contractors on DEBRA. 
Once construction began, conduct job site visits and employee interviews using HOT Form 11. Carefully review weekly certified payrolls, reports, and supporting documentations for the duration of the project. Issue due diligence notifications to the prime contractor describing the deficiencies to be re remedied. Identify and correct all deficiencies before billing PRDOH for CVGDR reimbursement. Issue our letter of authorization for DREBRA to the prime contractor prior to project closure and retain records for six years in accordance with the housing records retention policy. This is the form 4010. I'm sorry, that's on, that, is, that is in Spanish. This is the form 4010 and you can uh, access this form in our website, in this link. Help, help you establish the minimum wage. These are the job site posters that you are uh, required to have. You can locate those on this link that we have provided or in the website for the DOL. Contractor penalties and consequences of non-compliance. Contractors that are found to be in violation of the DEBRA may have contract payments withheld in insufficient amounts to satisfy the unpaid wages and liquidated damages that resulted from violations, may be subject to debarment from future contracts for up to three years, may have grounds to have their contract terminated in, in extreme cases, and may be subject to hot sanctions, denying participation in hot programs or debarment from future hot programs, may be subject to civil or criminal prosecution. This is the Davis Bacon resources page in our website and this is where you can find you can find uh, additional resources and forms. Let's talk about reporting. Documentation of efforts templates. This tool allows contractors and recipients and subrecipients to identify how they are performing efforts to be in compliance with Section 3 and MWBE efforts, as well as Davis Bacon and everything else. The quarterly reporting templates uh, allows contractors and recipients to report on data for PRDOH to continually monitor progress throughout the year. The quarterly report includes PRDOH unit report captures the Section 3 data, the MWBE data, the Fair Housing and Equal uh, Opportunity data, and the Davis-Bacon All Found Workers data. The quarterly reporting dates are on April 5, July 5, October 5, and January 5. Let's talk about frequent asked questions. Can a business be both Section 3 and MWBE? Yes, a business subcontractor can be both because these compliance areas are separate. Section 3 identify level of income to determine status and MWBE uses race and gender information to qualify businesses. If I am not planning on subcontracting, do I still need to complete documents? Yes, you should still submit your MWBE utilization plan, the documentation of efforts template, and the quarterly reports. If Section 3 doesn't apply to my contract, do I still need, do I still have to complete the quarterly report? Yes, you will have to complete the MWBE report and the FHEO report areas. If I am either MBE or WBE, do I fulfill the total goals? You may have safe harbor for one of the goals for MWBE participation, 10%, but you still have an additional 10% goal to show good faith efforts for any subcontracting or purchasing you perform with CVGDR funding. What happens if you don't, feel, do, don't fulfill the goals before the end of my contract? All awarded contractors should perform and document efforts. 
PRDOH has developed templates discussed in this presentation that help you complete this exercise. You can submit a waiver before the end of your contract for approval. This waiver request should be submitted with the efforts and justifications as appropriate. Training to provide a statement of compliance with my certified payrolls while completion uh, of the actual DOL form 347 is optional. It is mandatory for covered contract and subcontractors performing work on federally financed or assisted construction contracts to respond to the information collection contained. The Copeland Act, contractors and subcontractors performing work on federally financed or assisted construction contract to furnish weekly a statement with respect of the wages paid each employee during the preceding week. U.S. Department of Labor regulations require contractors to submit weekly a copy of a payroll to a federal agency contracting for or financing the construction project accompanied by a signed statement of compliance indicating that the payrolls are correct and complete and that each laborer and mechanic has been paid not less than the proper Davis Bacon prevailing wage rate for the work performed. DOL and federal contracting agency receiving this information review the information to determine how employees have received legally re required wages and fringe benefits. All right, the, uh, my presentation is, is uh, I have finished. So thank you to the procurement team, uh, all my team that has uh, put together this important information. Thank you. Well, this is the end of the previous meeting. We would like to thank um, all the panelists and all the participants for um, being here and listening to this um, important meeting. Um, the, the recording of this um, meeting as well as the presentation um, presentations viewed here today will be published in an addendum that will be um, posted in our TWDR website soon. So um, please be visit it regularly to be able to get and download that um, document. So we thank you and have a great day. Take care.